Good morning and happy Sabbath. On this day after Christmas, the Sabbath right after Christmas, I hope you had a wonderful Christmas yesterday. And I'm so glad you're joining us today to study with the Edmonds Adventist Church online. Let's bow our heads for prayer as we begin. Lord, it's always a joy to be able to study your word together. And today, as we study and look at an introduction to this book that we'll be studying for the next 13 weeks, we pray that you will guide our thinking, guide our minds, and we pray that our study of Isaiah over the next quarter will truly be a blessing to our hearts and to our church. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, I am going to do something a little different today. Generally, we follow the lesson quarterly, the Sabbath school lesson quarterly, the Bible guides of the Adventist church. But today we are going to skip the lesson that we would be studying. And we're going to kind of jump ahead to next week. Um, I want to do an introduction today to the book of Isaiah. For the next 13 weeks, we're going to be studying it. Now, obviously, it can't be a very in-depth study when there are 66 chapters in the book of Isaiah, and we're only going to spend 13 weeks on it. That means an average of about five chapters every week, and a lot of these chapters are long. So, obviously, we're not going to cover it in great detail. But next week, the quarterly just dives right in to studying chapter 1. And I thought that we would be benefited by a little bit of historical introduction to the book, a little bit of background before we actually jump into the first chapter. And so today we're going to do an introduction to the next 13 weeks when we will be studying the book of Isaiah. So... Um, I admit that a lot of this is kind of historical material. Um, you won't remember it all, I'm sure, but you will have it here available. In fact, if you'd like, I can even put the PowerPoint on the uh, website so that you can go back and uh, check some of this uh, as we go through Isaiah. If you want to kind of see where we are, for instance, in the chronology or remember certain things about the background of Isaiah. So let's start today by just reminding ourselves of about 500 years of chronology in Israel's history, and then see where Isaiah fits into that. So let's take a very, very quick tour through the chronology of Israel and Judah. From 971 to 931, Solomon, David's son, ruled over Israel and Judah. Israel referring to the ten northern tribes and Judah to the two southern tribes, the tribe of Judah and Benjamin. The northern tribe is often called Ephraim because Ephraim was one of the biggest of those tribes in the ten tribes of Israel. Now, when Solomon ruled over them, it was a united country but there were still divisions between Israel and Judah. And those came to a head when Solomon died and his son Rehoboam took over. Rehoboam ruled in Judah, but the ten northern tribes revolted against Rehoboam. And they separated under Jeroboam. So you had Jeroboam, king of Israel, and Rehoboam, king of Judah. And so this is around 931 that they become two separate countries. Israel went on for a couple hundred years, but in 722, they were destroyed by Assyria. And Israel was never really restored. Remnants of Israel uh, lived in Palestine, but for the most part, Israel simply ceased to exist after 722. But the southern kingdom, the tribes of Judah and Benjamin, went on 
They were generally called Judah, but after Israel is gone, sometimes they are also called Israel. And they went on until 605 and beyond. In 605, Babylon came and defeated Judah and took some captives. Daniel and his companions were among those captives taken off to Babylon. And Babylon let Judah know that if they would simply uh, stay loyal and recognize Babylon's leadership, they would be okay. But they were not willing to do that. And so, a few years later, in 586, Babylon returned under Nebuchadnezzar. He destroyed their temple, devastated the land, and carried the rest of the people captive left only some of the poorest in the land. So 586, the southern kingdom, Judah, is destroyed by Babylon and carried captive. But in 536, King Cyrus of Persia, who had defeated the Babylonians, issued a decree saying that the Jews could return to Jerusalem. Now, not all of them did, but some did. And so we have a return of the Jews who were captive in Babylon to Jerusalem. From about 536 to 444, they returned in three main stages, as outlined in the books of Ezra and Nehemiah, which we studied in our Sabbath school lessons a couple years ago. So here's just kind of the basic chronology of those three movements under Ezra and Nehemiah. First of all, there was the initial return under Zerubbabel and Joshua in 536. The decree came forth from Cyrus that they could go, and then uh, Darius the Great, Darius the Great, issued a proclamation that they could restore the temple. And that work was done from about 520 to 515, but with very mixed emotions at the dedication. Some of the old timers who had seen the glory of the old temple wept because it just didn't compare, whereas many of the younger were delighted to see the temple, so there was both rejoicing and sadness at that point. Then you have the return under Ezra the scribe, from about 458, 457. Here there is a mandate from the Persian king. Now, uh, Darius is off the scene, and it is Artaxerxes. And the task of Ezra is primarily religious, restoring a knowledge of the law. And then, and for, in 445, 444, you have the arrival of Nehemiah, who was the king's... Uh, wine taster, and uh, under Artaxerxes also, he is given permission to go back and rebuild the wall. And he becomes the governor and separates people from the foreigners that they had been associating with, and the wall is rebuilt and dedicated. So we have just in a couple of minutes covered 500 years of Israel's history, from the time of Solomon down to the time of Nehemiah. So our question today is, where does Isaiah fit in this 500 years? Well, according to Isaiah 1.1, we read the vision concerning Judah and Jerusalem. Notice that the focus is on the southern kingdom of Judah and Jerusalem, that Isaiah, son of Amaz, saw, Amaz, pardon me, saw, during the reigns of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah. So you have a total of four kings, and Isaiah ministers during the time of those four kings. Now, the first of those is Uzziah, who ruled from 790 to 739. So Isaiah's ministry began sometime during those years, presumably toward the end. And his real call comes, remember, uh, when, I, when Isaiah dies. So uh, we read that in Isaiah 6. So 
probably toward the end of that reign of Isaiah is when Isaiah's ministry begins. And then it continues on through the time of Hezekiah, who reigned from 729 to 686. And um, so somewhere during that time, Isaiah's ministry ended. We don't really hear much after 701, 700. So people presume that it ended somewhere around maybe 700 to 698. Now, Isaiah's ministry, as we said, focused on the southern kingdom of Judah. However, he did speak to the northern kingdom and predict that they would be destroyed. And you see it was during his ministry, 722, when the northern kingdom was destroyed. Now, we can identify two major events in Isaiah's ministry from his messages in Isaiah. Uh, one of those happened around 735 at the time when Ahaz um, was king. The northern kingdom of Israel and Syria, who were usually enemies, banded together to fight Judah and they sieged Jerusalem. Judah appealed to Assyria. And eventually the attackers withdrew. And this is represented in Isaiah 7. Then there is the time when Assyria came and put Jerusalem under siege. In fact, they destroyed many of the villages and uh, fortified cities of Judah. And they laid siege on Jerusalem. But... As Isaiah sees as a miraculous event of God's intervention, they withdrew. And that story is told in 2 Kings 18 and 19. And it's also told again in Isaiah 36 to 39. So we have the story twice in Kings and Isaiah, very much the same story in both of those books. Isaiah ministered to both situations, and in both, his call to Judah was to trust in God rather than in making military alliances and depending on other nations, and at the same time, a call to repentance. Now, when we read through Isaiah, we find that there is a change of scene in the book. And I want to talk about that a little bit. And uh, in some circles, this is controversial. Um, but let me just explain the situation. And um, I cannot say definitively what the truth is, but I will show you which way I lean. In the first 39 chapters of Isaiah, Isaiah warns Judah of coming destruction if they persist in their idolatry and they fail to trust God. These are messages primarily focused on Judah, but also focused, as we'll see, on the foreign nations around them, but focused on Judah during this time in the late 700s. So maybe 740-ish down to 700-ish. That Isaiah is speaking to the people of Judah and telling them that there is going to be judgment if they don't repent. Now, as we have already seen, judgment did come, and the Babylonians came and destroyed Judah in 586. Now, as you can see, this is a full century, plus a little, after Isaiah's ministry. So Babylon doesn't come and destroy Judah until almost or maybe a little more than a century after the time of Isaiah. From Isaiah 40 on, the book of Isaiah addresses a different situation. During this time, Judah is captive, and God gives comfort and promises of restoration that he is going to release them from captivity, and that they will return to Zion with singing and joy. Now, how do we explain this? 
I, the, the, the people of Judah aren't carried captive to Babylon until 586. So the messages in Isaiah 40 and beyond seem to be addressing a situation more than a century after the time of Isaiah. So there are two major possibilities. One is that God simply shows Isaiah the future. And there in the 8th century, he gives comfort to those living in the 6th century, even mentioning the name of Cyrus, who will be the one who allows them to return. Cyrus, of course, was a Persian king, and he defeated Babylon. And then after he defeated Babylon in 539, he let the Jews return in 536. So the last part of Isaiah from chapter 40 on even mentions the name of Cyrus and speaks to the people of Judah while they are in captivity in Babylon. So some would say God simply gave Isaiah a message for the future and he predicted what would happen long after his death. The second possibility is that Isaiah was actually written over a period of time by different inspired writers, and the messages were later ed edited and put together in one book, but that Isaiah represents messages given over a period of time, not all to the same person or written simply as one book by one person, but different inspired writers gave messages over a period of time, and they were eventually put into the book of Isaiah. Now, I would not want to deny at all that God could predict the future and give messages to a prophet a couple hundred years before they actually occurred. But I think there is evidence for the second uh, of the possibilities. Uh, some words left out there, but the second of the possibilities. Um, and let me show you what I think some of that is. First of all, even within the first part of Isaiah, verse, chapters 1 to 39, we find different kinds of material that suggest to me that there has been editing, that this is not simply one person sitting down and writing a book like somebody might today. First of all, there are visions where Isaiah presents the word of the Lord, where he says the word of the Lord came, and then we hear God speaking in the first person. There's also material where Isaiah speaks in the first person and gives speeches himself. But there's also material where Isaiah is spoken about in the third person, as if there is a narrator writing and talking about Isaiah. So the book seems to have material about Isaiah, material from Isaiah, and visions where God speaks um, by giving the word of the Lord to Isaiah. All of this seems to suggest a process of editing. And we know, for instance, from the Gospel of Luke, that editing can be part of the process of God communicating with us in the Bible. Right at the beginning of the Gospel of Luke, Luke says that he wasn't an eyewitness to these events, but other people have attempted to write down an account of Jesus' life, and he has made use of those and is trying now to write an orderly account. So we know from Scripture that there is an editing process that is often part of God's inspiration to give us Scripture. Now, we do have to admit on the other side, however, that there are no manuscripts that have any kind of separation between the two parts of Isaiah. The very oldest manuscripts of Isaiah are found among the Dead Sea Scrolls. That's a couple to 300 years before the time of Christ. And there, of course, they didn't have the same chapter divisions that we have. Those came later. But there, Isaiah 40 just follows right on the same page from Isaiah 39. There is no uh, separation at all between the two. But I tend to think that we're really looking at a different part of, uh, of the process, probably to different writers, 
in the last part of Isaiah, speaking to a situation now over a century later where God is comforting those who have been taken captive. Now, we mentioned there are different kinds of material in Isaiah. Let's just go through some of the kinds of things we're going to see as we look at Isaiah. First of all, there's the prophetic call vision, which we have in, in other prophets as well. In Isaiah 6, where Isaiah talks about the experience he had in being called to be a prophet. There are prophetic oracles that come from God, where God speaks. And there are different kinds of oracles that have been uh, uh, identified by scholars because the different oracles kind of take on a different form. They are virtually all poetic. The prophets speak in poetry. And if you read a modern translation of the Bible, most of Isaiah will be lined out as poetry. And as we will see when we go through, has many of the characteristics of Hebrew poetry. Many of the same things, for instance, that we find in the Psalms. Within these poetic oracles, there are oracles of salvation, where God gives promises to the people. There are oracles of doom, which say, it is inevitable, your judgment is coming. There are oracles of woe, which say, woe to you because you're doing this, but if you repent, there's still a chance. There are oracles against other nations besides Judah. Isaiah primarily ministers to Judah, but he also has oracles against um, the nations around them. And then there are oracles of comfort, where God comforts the captives. In addition, we find historical narratives. We've already mentioned Isaiah 36 to 39, which gives us the narrative of Assyria's siege of Jerusalem. There are speeches by Isaiah, um, as well as ones where he conveys the word of the Lord. There's satirical prose. Um, we'll see that in Isaiah 44, where Isaiah... Um, gives kind of a, com a comedic routine about uh, idolatry and chides Israel because they take a piece of wood and use half of it for firewood to cook their food and half of it to make an idol out of to worship. And then there are songs, and we will see one of these next week in our study in Isaiah chapter 5. So we have lots of different kinds of material that we'll be looking at in Isaiah. What about Isaiah himself? What do we know about him? Well, as I said, he is mentioned in historical narratives in 2 Kings 19 and 20, and in, uh, in Chronicles 32, um, 2 Chronicles, that is. Also, 2 Chronicles 26, 22 has something intriguing to say. It says, The other events of Isaiah's reign, from beginning to end, are recorded by the prophet Isaiah, son of Amos. Now that's interesting, because we don't have anything by Isaiah that gives the events of Isaiah's reign. So apparently, Isaiah wrote some things that we don't have anymore in addition to what we find in the book of Isaiah. We also find Isaiah mentioned in both first and third person throughout the first part of Isaiah. In chapters 1 to 37, Isaiah is mentioned and Isaiah speaks. Interestingly, once we get to chapter 40, from 40 to 66, we never see Isaiah's name again. We know from chapter 8 that Isaiah was married and the names of his sons had prophetic significance. Isaiah did some strange things. He was told by God to strip and go barefoot for three years as a prophetic illustration. We'll see that when we get to Isaiah 20. What are the themes that we find in Isaiah? Certainly the character of God. Isaiah 5.16, But the Lord of hosts is exalted by justice. And the holy God shows himself holy by righteousness. We see that God is a God of justice and a God of righteousness. And a God who cares 
about his people, especially the marginalized and the weak. We also see the theme of Israel's rebellion and unfaithfulness, which results in judgment and destruction. There is a very strong emphasis in Isaiah on social justice. Care for the widow, care for the orphan, care for the poor. And Isaiah is deaf on worship that goes on without justice. The idea that people come and bring sacrifices at the same time that they are acting against their neighbor with injustice, he finds to be the height of folly. We'll see that next week when we look at chapter 1. We also have, especially in the last part of the book, strong emphasis on comfort and restoration and promise. Also in the book of Isaiah, there's the theme of judgment on the foreign nations. But there's also a vision for the foreign nations, that Israel will come to the place where the foreign nations will come and there will be unity. And there's a vision that God will be God and king of the other nations as well. A vision that we will find taken up in the New Testament. And what about Isaiah and the New Testament? There are more quotes from and allusions to Isaiah in the New Testament than any other Old Testament book. Isaiah is directly quoted by name in the New Testament 22 times. And if you look at all the quotes and allusions where words from Isaiah are taken or alluded to, there are about 572 within the New Testament. Psalms is second with 553. One question has to do with archaeology and Isaiah. There has been just in the last decade a seal. You know, people had seals that they stamped on things, and a seal has been found with the name Isaiah. He was found in Jerusalem and not far from a seal of Hezekiah. So some have felt that this may be actually the seal of Hezekiah the prophet. Is it? Maybe yes, maybe no. The name Isaiah on the seal is followed by three Hebrew letters. And those three letters could be the first three letters of the four-letter word in Hebrew for prophet. So some are saying this was Isaiah the prophet. However, we would expect to have a definite article before prophet in that case, and that is lacking. So people are not sure. That might be instead of prophet, simply the name of where this Isaiah uh, came from, or the name of a parent, could be a place name or a person name. And if so, that wouldn't fit, because those three letters would not fit with uh, Amos, who is uh, the father of Isaiah. So we don't know, but it's kind of an interesting thing to see uh, whether this might have been Isaiah's actual seal. Now we are, whoops, running out of time. And so I need to talk about next week. We will start into the book of Isaiah next week, and I'd like for you to have the Bible study guide. And if you don't have an actual copy of it, be sure to get it. And the URL is there on your screen right now, absg.adventist.org. That's absg.adventist.org. And you will find the quarterly there, and you can study in advance for our lesson each week. We will start into this next Saturday morning at 10 o'clock, and there are two passages that are uh, material we'll look at, uh, that the quarterly will look at for next week, Isaiah 1, and then also Isaiah 5, 1 to 7. So Isaiah chapter 1 and Isaiah 5, 1 to 7. In Isaiah 5, 1 to 7, you will see this unique song, and we'll talk next week about an interesting wordplay that Isaiah makes in that song. Also in Isaiah 1, you will see Isaiah's strong emphasis on social justice. So I look forward to these next 13 weeks.
as we look at the book of Isaiah, and I hope you will be studying right along with us as we do. Let's pray as we close. Lord God, we are grateful for this Christmas season, and we are grateful that we can look at this book over the next 13 weeks, and we pray that as we do, you will lead us and guide us by your Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Please stay tuned. We will have our worship service in just a little less than a half an hour. We'll be celebrating communion today, so be sure and uh, get some uh, grape juice and some bread so that you can celebrate communion with us as we have our worship service. Looking forward to seeing you then in about a half an hour. Have a blessed rest of your Sabbath.